All right, good afternoon. How many of you have been blessed so far with the meetings? That's wonderful. We have too. And um, as the Sabbath is approaching, we're looking forward to um, more food from the Word. And so I just want to introduce myself um, and my husband to you. I'm Jennifer. This is Andre Castelvano. We're both physicians. We live in uh, Berrien Springs, Michigan, and we have three young children. And uh, we have been on a journey with the Lord and with our family. And we were asked to speak on, it's called After Hours, on, on the home, sacrificing our careers and our lives for the home. And so today we're going to move a little bit away from the medical work outside the home, and we're going to look at how we, can, um, how we can impact our home for the Lord. And so before we get started, I'm going to uh, ask uh, you to bow your heads and we'll have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we talk about a topic that is so dear to you, the family, we know that there is a war on our homes and we need your strength to lead and guide our families to you. And so I pray that your Holy Spirit will be here and that you remove all distraction and that we may um, gain a blessing from your words today. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, now before we share our journey, we have some participation, um, some time here to work together. So hopefully everybody has a piece of paper and a pen in front of them. If you don't, we have some extras. So raise your hand or find one. There's probably some nearby. And I want you to take this. This is an activity for everybody, no matter where you are in life. This is for everyone to participate in, no spectators, okay? And what we're going to do today is we're going to incorporate a little bit of art. And I am no artist, you'll see in just a second. Uh, but there's a little bit of art here. We're going to, I want you to draw a picture on this piece of paper of your family vision, okay? Your family vision. So what is your family vision? This is an event that's taking place in about 20 years, if you have young kids, or maybe 10 years if your kids are older, or sometime in the future. And your family vision is what you want your family to be like. How do you want to treat each other? What do, you, what do you want to be talking about? What do you want to be doing? And the idea behind this family vision is that it's a special event that happens every year. Maybe it's a, a holiday where you're all together. Maybe it's a special family vacation that you go on each year uh, or some other special event. But it's something that you do hopefully every year, almost every year. And it's something that's uh, reproducible because you're wanting to work towards this family vision that's 20 years off into the future. Um, so we're gonna take just a couple minutes for you to do that. And if you have a question, feel free. This whole talk is, can be interactive. Um, this one, just so you kind of have an idea of what ours was, this is me drawing. I did this in the room last night. Okay, so it can be done. And this is a camping trip. We love going camping. And this is supposed to be us in 20 years. There's lots of stick figures down there. Um, maybe our kids, there's a significant other or two. Maybe even our kids have had a kid or two in 20 years. And we're camping. We're off by the water. We're singing songs. Hopefully, we're telling stories of um, different things that have happened that past year and sharing, opening the Bible. Um, and this is this is what we're thinking we'd love to our family to be like in 20 years. So just take a couple minutes to draw something. It doesn't have to be anything special. You don't need to put this on the wall when you get home. Just something. We're going to reference this a little bit during our talk today. So just take a minute and just draw something on that page. And while you're doing that, uh, when we first did this, we were encouraged to think about maybe the smells that you might be smelling, the foods that you might be eating, maybe the songs you're singing, um, all the different things. The sounds, the activities, 
try and put yourself in that place. And it's, it's something that Andre mentioned, practicing every year, something that's annual. Some people might pick, you know, maybe Christmas or a holiday means a lot to their family, and, and that's, that's the, the thing they want to look at as their family vision. Other people might have a favorite vacation or, you know, annual trip. I think you already mentioned mm -hmm. that, so... All right, just a little bit longer. And if you want to continue drawing while we're talking, that's okay, too. All right, is anyone brave enough to show us your family vision pictures? Go ahead. We'll just hold it up for us. We want to see it from there. All right, can you tell us what, what's on there? Yeah, wonderful. That's yeah, wonderful. Thank you, thank thank you for, for sharing. sharing Anyone else want to share? I'm going to hold up yours. This is Andre's that he drew. That's the whole thing. We zoomed in on it on the, the screen there. All right, we'll let you guys keep working on that. We're going to take you on a journey today to realize your family vision. And as we move forward, I want to share with you our anchor passage for this afternoon. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. When I study the Bible, I like to look up um, especially significant words or words I, I might not know the definition to. And I, my favorite resource for definitions is the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. And um, so I looked up frontlets. What, what are frontlets? Well, actually, a frontlet is a frontal or a brow band it's a band that is worn on your forehead, and we know just behind our forehead is our prefrontal cortex where we make all our decisions. So, so a sign on your hand, our actions, what we're doing, and frontlets between your eyes, what, what our minds are thinking. Have his word in, how, in what we're doing and in our thoughts. So I'm going to ask you some questions this morning, and I would like, uh, regarding this passage, and I would like you just to shout out or speak up. Um, we're going to be very interactive. So first, what is God teaching about family in this passage? Unity. 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 Absolutely. Any other thoughts? Perseverance. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Families should be spiritual. Absolutely. Yes. Constant commitment. Yeah. Scripture memorization. I think we missed one. Did we miss one? God should come first. Yes, thank you. Thank you for sharing those. Absolutely. Okay, our next question is, what does this passage tell us about who Jesus Christ is? Yeah, yes. relationship oriented. Yeah, what does this teach us about who Jesus Christ is? Any other thoughts? The first thing that comes to my mind is the value he has on our children. I mean, if we're supposed to be spending our time 24 7 teaching them his love from his word, he must value them a lot. All right, our third question and final question on this passage that I want you to think about and answer, 
What is Christ calling us to do in regards to our family with this passage? We've mentioned a couple things that would apply there. Teach them about God's word. I heard something, intentionality. Be intentional. I like that. Okay, well, we're going to be talking more about those things as we, as we move on. This passage has been an anchor passage in our home for the last 10 years, and we would like to share with you some of our journey and how we are applying this word for our family. Well, our journey goes through Southern, where we met, Southern Adventist University, went to Loma Linda for medical school, and then off to Wright State University, which is in Dayton, Ohio, where I finished my emergency medicine residency and Jennifer finished medical school there. But our journey really starts about 10 years ago. We were in our final year in Dayton, Jen's final year of med school, my final year of residency, and we noticed some gradual shifts in our life. We felt like they needed to be reevaluated. We felt like certain things were just slipping. And so we took a weekend in January of that year, and we, we went away, and we came up with what we called New Year commitments. These were not resolutions that you typically make and immediately forget about. These were commitments. We called them New Year commitments. And We picked four topics, devotional life, diet, exercise, and media. And we wanted to make changes in these categories, changes that we would reevaluate at the end of each month. How did we do? Do we want to keep doing what we changed? Do we want to change that even more? Um, And these commitments really put us on a trajectory for our marriage and eventually our family that stands to this day. Um, they, They had a very significant impact on us. And the one that probably had the biggest impact, at least the one that was most noticeably felt right away, was the media one. We we chose to do a media fast, a three-month media fast. That meant no TV, no movies, no sports, no podcasts, no secular books or music. We didn't even search the internet other than school or work-related stuff. And at the end of that three months, we noticed our tastes had changed. Just like anything, when you go away from it long enough, you can now see it brand new. And our tastes had changed and have remained changed. We've had our ups and downs, as anyone does. But we reference all the way back to those New Year commitments that we made in that three-month fast that really made a significant difference. And around that same time, we also came in contact with a, a, a series called Media on the Brain. Some of you may have seen it or heard of it. If not, I highly recommend it. And it just further confirmed in us this need to make significant lifelong changes. And we threw away hundreds, if not thousands of dollars worth of CDs and DVDs. Uh, We just wanted them gone. We wanted to make that commitment, that change. And moving to today, media has a relatively small impact, minimal impact in our home, um, which It does help that we live in the country and we barely get internet at our house and our phone service cuts in and out. So, but we don't mind that so much either. The next thing that we chose to really make uh, a choice to change or to do was to get out of debt. We really wanted to get out of our student loan debt. We had both borrowed the entirety of medical school education loans, which as a lot of you know is quite substantial. And I was finishing residency and about to start making a decent paycheck finally, but Jen was going to start residency, so we were still you know, not making a full income, but we really wanted to get out of debt. And we decided we were going to save our money, our extra earnings. Every three to six months, we would take whatever was left in that pot after we had paid for normal things, and we would just put it all on loans every three to six months. And Boom, chunk by chunk by chunk, we saw that number go down. And it took a while. We set a five-year goal, and we nearly met it. We didn't quite make it. It took about six years for us. Uh, But we did it. We We did stick with it, and we were able to eliminate that debt. And we celebrated. We loved that feeling. But it was not a feeling of 
pride and the ability, we really felt God had gotten us to that point and helped us. And so we actually celebrated by taking that next paycheck and giving a special love offering um, to an organization that we were really impressed with. Now, during this time, we became a family. We weren't just a couple anymore. And we were listening to a children on train, uh, listening to a, uh, a series on training up children and reading all the books. Uh, we really wanted to raise our children with God in mind, with, with an intentionality um, that God was inspiring how we were doing it. And as we continued to have children, as our family grew, Jen felt a very strong conviction to cut back at work. She had finished residency in anesthesiology, and she had finished her boards, and she was already working part-time, but she wasn't working part-time enough. So we started looking and praying for a job opportunity that would let her cut back even more. And we found one right there in Tennessee where we were living. We thought, this looked good. This is probably what God has in, in store for us. Now, at the same time, we felt led to move into the country. We were in a subdivision, and we loved it. We loved our neighbors, but we felt strongly that we wanted to live in the country. We wanted to have land. We wanted our children to be outside as much as possible. And we had read Country Living, and this confirmed in us a feeling um, that we wanted to be out in the country. And we were looking for a piece of land. We were praying. We were fasting. Nothing. We couldn't find it. And the job opportunity was kind of just there but hadn't materialized yet. So we took a break from looking for a house and we just paused a little bit. Now at this time, an opportunity came up in Southwest Michigan. And I should interject here that before we got married, my wife mentioned to me she will never live in Michigan. Never. Be careful what you say because God may have different plans for you. And Just be careful. I'll I'll stop there. Uh, So this opportunity came up. It was an opportunity worth at least looking at. So we interviewed, and the job was good for me. It looked good, but I had no plans of accepting it because of the statement I already mentioned. So Jen looked at me, and she said, well, how how do I just say no to this opportunity? And I told her, well, just ask for everything. Not like the list that you like, but like everything on the plus I would like this and this and this list. And there's no way they'll say yes to that because that job just doesn't exist. So just ask for all of it. They'll say no. uh, And then we can politely say no. And we'll keep looking in Tennessee. So that's what she did. She gave them the full list. And she got off the phone. She came over to me and she said, well, they said, sure, we can do that. And so then she said, well, how do I still say no? I was still finding a way to get out of moving to Michigan. (laughs) Yeah. But God was working on her heart, and we prayed and talked to some trusted friends, and they helped us see that maybe God was calling us to Michigan. And Jen really felt strongly that she wanted that door to be swung wide open, and at the same time, if God was truly leading us there, please help the doors to close for this other opportunity, and that's exactly what happened. That door closed, and the door just swung even more open in Michigan. There was a piece of land uh, with a house on it. This is actually a picture of our property there in the corner, Um, and it it stayed for sale for almost a whole year while we were going through this whole process, and God just clearly opened this door. We have a house, a creek, a pond, a big garden, a barn. I even have a tractor. Jen likes to joke that when she met me, I was a golfer driving a Lexus, and now I'm a tractor driving farmer (laughs) ER doctor. So life life will take you on some interesting paths. All right, so now I'm I'm working one day a week, and I spend most of my time raising our three children. So that's it, right? All these sacrifices we've made for our family. We removed media from our home. We got out of debt. We moved to the country. We prioritized more time at home, making career and financial sacrifices. We should have the perfect little family, right? Not at all. 
This was just the beginning. Now the Lord could focus us on what really matters, character development. And let me just interject here. I didn't think we had it like all figured out, but I did think like we had done a lot. Like we had tried hard to let God lead us and we had, he had led us. But I, I did think like all these choices we had made would then like equal like easier parenting and a more cohesive family. And like when my kids would then fight or argue or be defiant or any of these, you know, attributes you don't necessarily want, it's like, well, I did the things I was supposed to do. Why is this happening? So we all want families that will stand boldly for the right and that will have a love for Jesus exuding from them, that they will shine as a light in this world, in a world that's, that needs a light. And this work can only be done through the Holy Spirit working in each of our lives. And there's a part that we have to play in leading our family and our home. So now more than ever, as we were doing our very best, reading the best resources, trying to raise our children for the kingdom, we realized individually how far we were from it. But the Lord is good. His mercies are everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. And he has led us into several areas that are making a profound impact in our home life. And we are going to share with you now five keys to an abundant home that we have found to be essential in fulfilling Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9 in our family. And there are some uh, key resources. Uh, we actually printed off handouts of some of the very best resources that we have found beneficial in the last 10 years. And so there's handouts in the back afterwards. A couple of them you will find um, heavily referenced in our first two um, uh, uh, keys. So the first key that we are going to talk about is self-government. What is self-government? Self-government is being able to determine the cause and effect of any given situation and possessing a knowledge of your own behavior so that you can, your own behaviors so that you can control them. Well, that's a lot. So in our journey to an abundant home, we realized our need of self-government. We have a lot of personality in our home, and each family member brings a different dynamic to the group. So having a home with true calmness and self-government has been a real need for us. Around this time of realization, the Lord worked it out for me to last minute attend a homeschool conference, and I happened into the lecture of a woman speaking on this very topic. And through her teaching, I learned practical tools that have helped me to apply the principles of child guidance that I had been reading to my own parenting. She spoke of the importance of calmness, of understanding roles in the family. She talked of four basic skills and how to win the hearts of our children instead of battling for control. We incorporate these elements into our home, and we are, we're going to look at... For these four basic skills um, specifically, and each skill has different steps. And we use them so frequently that my two-year-old can rattle off all the steps. If you find one of my children, they'll just rattle off all the steps to these skills. We don't have time to go through all four of them, but I do want to at least uh, do two um, of the skills. The four basic skills are follow an instruction, accept a no answer, accept a consequence or correction, disagree appropriately. These skills can be applied to almost every situation that we will face in life, at home, in the workplace, in the community, on the church board meeting. We don't have time to go through, like I said, each skill, but we'll first cover a couple of them. So follow an instruction. There are five steps to following an instruction. Look at the person with a calm voice, face, and body. Say okay or ask to disagree appropriately. Do the task immediately and check back. 
So it's very important looking at the person, making eye contact. It binds the hearts together and it helps you to see each other for who you are. Uh, this has very recently been demonstrated with my two-year-old. I was telling her, Alyssa, I need you to take this to your room. And she's just continuing to do her own thing, not really paying attention. She might have even said no. And I got down at her level and I looked her in the eye and she looked at me and I said, Alyssa, I need you to take this to your room. And she looked at me and she said, okay, mommy. And she took it to her room. So just making that eye contact draws you into each other, to a connection with each other. And let me just interject our six-year-old too. I have, he's, he's used to me saying this now because of working through these, but he'll be looking off. He's, he's got ADD and he's just all over the place. And I'll be giving him an instruction and I'll say, Joshua, you need to look at me, and he's looking all over, and I say, Josh, you connect with me, and that's like a cue to make eye contact with me, and it really, it really does. This first one, I think it makes sense, but it really has made a difference, this connection that's made between parent and child, this eye contact. Um, so I just wanted to yeah. interject that. So with a calm voice, face, and body. So if they look at you, you know, all upset, or maybe you're upset and looking at them, if... We all need to have a calm voice, a calm face, and a calm body. How am I standing? Am I talking to my child like this? Or am I relaxed and calm as I approach them? And this is really important, too, because we are a representation of God to our children. And are we representing his love accurately when we're disciplining our children and so that's something to think about as we go through. OK, the next step, say OK. We have our kids say okay, mommy, or okay, daddy, or ask to disagree appropriately. This gives them the power to express themselves. They can always ask to disagree appropriately, and, and there's a, a set of, of um, steps for that skill. Now, they may not always get what they want, but they get to be heard. And sometimes their perception is different than what, what I have perceived the situation to be. And then they need to do the task immediately. If it's not done immediately, then it's not obedience. And it must be done with a happy heart, which is why they need to say, okay, mommy, or okay, daddy. And then they need to check back. So checking back is something like, I did it, mommy. Is there anything else? And this gives you an opportunity to praise them because they need, they need a consequence, in this case, a good consequence, because they did what you asked them to do. So it, it gives you an opportunity to praise them. They can accept that praise. And it also gives them an opportunity to show respect to you. And so by teaching our children these steps, we have found that they have much more of a clear direction and follow through when we give them an, an instruction. And um, it's made a big difference for us. Our next skill that I want to go over, because I can't, I, I would love to just go over all of these, but we don't have time. I do want to cover accept a no answer. Now, this has four steps. Several are, are like the first um, one. Look at the person, the eye contact, with a calm voice, face, and body. Say okay or ask to disagree appropriately. Drop the subject. So dropping the subject means stop thinking about it, stop asking for it, stop desiring it. And so they have not actually accepted no, a no answer until they've dropped the subject. If they say okay and then they walk away and they're still wanting that thing that they can't have, they haven't actually dropped the subject. On our flight down here, um, uh, my mother-in-law packed little goodie bags for the kids and they had um, these teddy bear graham crackers, teddy grams, and my two-year-old called them gummy bears. And so she looked at me, it was the middle of the afternoon, we'd already had lunch, supper was going to be after we landed, and she said, Mommy, can I have the gummy bears? And I said, No, Alyssa, you may not eat the gummy bears. Okay, but can I have the gummy bears? And I said, no, Alyssa, you may not eat the gummy bears. OK, mommy, but can I have the gummy bears? <laughs> and then finally, she was messing with the package. And I said, Alyssa, what are you going to do when you open that package? Oh, I had told her, you have to wait till supper. And she looked at me. She said, I'm going to wait till supper. And I said, good. And she said, OK, so can I eat the gummy bears? <laughs> so she has a little bit of work to do with dropping the subject. But sometimes our Heavenly Father gives us a no answer. 
How often do we keep asking or thinking about something that we think should be the plan in our lives instead of surrendering to him, saying okay and dropping the subject? When we are able to drop the subject and surrender all to him, we can have the complete assurance that he is leading our lives, which is what we all truly want. It has been said that work is the antidote to a sick character. So when our children choose not to use their skills, they earn an extra chore. And when they choose to use their skills, then they receive a positive consequence like praise or high five, good job. So we are still working on incorporating each of these skills every day. And some days are more of a struggle than others, but overall the kids are learning not only how to obey their parents, but how to interact with each other in a united way. And my heart has been warmed when I'm listening to Joshua teach the different steps of disagreeing appropriately to my middle child who has them down very well. She, she disagrees appropriately with everything, which is okay. She, <laughs> as good as she knows she can, as long as she can accept Sometimes the no she'll, answer. Sometimes she'll just run up to me and I haven't even seen her and she'll say, Daddy, can I disagree appropriately? <laughs> uh, Jacqueline, I haven't asked you to do anything, but okay, what, what do you mean? <laughs> but she knows it's a way for her to express herself that we're going to listen to mm-hmm. and we're going to think about what she's saying. And like I said, she won't always get it, but there is a, a there's a a way for them to talk to you when they do this. And she knows that, and she's four, so she's still learning it, but she is really good at it. (laughs) So instead of floundering on how to handle situations that arise, now we have a system of government that leads to calmness and unity. The kids know what to expect, there are no surprises, and it's moving our home into calmness, which will bring us to our second key. But before I, I start that, I do want to mention one thing. Self-government is not just for children. It's for parents, too. And I already discussed how it um, can affect our work lives outside of the home. But also, it's important for um, parents to know that Kids see how mom and dad handle stressful situations, and they see how mom and dad treat each other, how they speak to each other, their tone, their body language. And when self-government is present and the parents are treating each other respectfully and with love, the children will have more respect and love for their parents. We have experienced this on both sides. And praise the Lord, he is growing us so that we can be a better example of him to our children. Our second key of the five is calmness. And I must admit, this is not an adjective that would naturally describe our home. It is so easy to get frustrated with all the little trials that seem to add up each day. I remember one day in particular, Andre had been working all day. He was on a 12-hour shift. I was home with the kids. The day had started out rough. And, and I usually do pretty well until the end of the day. And by the end of the day, I, just, I was just longing for Andre to be there. And I needed, I had one goal, get the kids in bed. I needed some quiet and some calm and just to to regenerate. And so I had four things. Okay, supper, bath, worship, bed. Okay, forget baths. Supper, worship, bed. We are moving to bed. And so we were working through those things. We got through supper. The kids, though, had more energy than normal, and it seemed like no one was listening to mommy, and everyone was running around, and no one was obeying, and finally, I said, why is no one listening to me? You know you are not supposed to be doing that. Go brush your teeth. My tone was harsh, my words were cutting, and I could instantly see the effect it had on my children. It brought out anger in one child, and while the eyes of the other showed hurt. And I was so frustrated at myself for losing my own self-control, I quickly got them into bed, and I just went to my room and cried. And, you know, Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Christ never needlessly spoke a severe word. He never gave needless pain to a sensitive soul. How could I practice restraint and replace my old language with the encouraging language from above? 
How could I stay calm among the most trying circumstances? This has been a particular area of growth or for growth, really, in my life. And there are a few tips that I want to share from resources that have been very helpful to me. I mentioned to you above that we had talked about, uh, that I was going to talk about some resources. And one is a lecture on encouraging language. The woman is a respected mother in a medical family of whom I could relate to. And she had already gone through almost the exact same scenario that I mentioned just a minute ago. And she shared how she overcame self, harshness, and a fault-finding attitude. We're so busy trying to train our children right that it's easy to correct that, correct that, correct that, and we miss the importance of praise. In fact, praise should happen eight to 10 times for every correction that we give. And pre-teaching and praise are found to be the two most effective ways of of creating a change in our children. It's not the consequences. And real quick, yeah. that, that pre-teach word, that's another one that our kids know really well. I'll say to Joshua or Jacqueline, I'm gonna pre-teach you something right now. Okay, if, if this happens, then this will happen. Or if this happens, this happens in a, in a good way too. And so that has become a little bit of a, a word that they know really mm -hmm. well too. And I just echo what she just said, that it has had a really big impact if they have been pre-taught something, if they've been told what will happen, they're, they're much more inclined to obey and stay calm and really... Because they're learning cause and effect. Yeah. They're learning if I do this, the result's going to be this. And so, you know, it's in their best interest to, to make a good choice. So I was listening to her share, and I was so encouraged to hear that I was not the only person struggling in this area. And not only that, but someone had found some answers. And I was so thankful for that. We can all overcome through the power of Jesus Christ. In Christ's Object Lessons, um, Ellen White states that in giving reproof and counsel, many indulge in sharp and wounding speech. Often the erring ones are stirred to rebellion. But that's the exact opposite of what we are going for. So we need to refrain from speaking harsh words. We need to replace our language instead of pointing out what they are doing wrong. Try leading them with positive statements. For example, instead of saying, don't throw that on the floor, try saying, let's keep that on the table. It helps our floor stay clean. Or instead of stop grabbing your sister, maybe say, let's treat each other with kindness and gentleness. And then we can point them towards the positive. Another important factor in uh, changing our language is to give this issue a high priority in our prayer life. I specifically pray Psalm 141 verse 3 regularly in the morning. It says, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. And I plead each morning that the Lord will guard my mouth and that he will put his spirit in me so that I can accurately show his love to my children. Next, we need to foster a cheerful, loving atmosphere in the home and freely show affection. In um, uh, another quote from Ellen White, it says, children are, attra are attracted by a cheerful, sunny demeanor. Show them kindness and courtesy, and they will manifest the same spirit towards you and toward one another. And finally, we need to praise our children. And I, I mentioned this a minute ago, but whatever that you can find that is praiseworthy needs to be praised. Uh, praise will not only be an effective way of changing behavior, but it will reach their heart and motivate them to use their skills that we've been teaching them. And sometimes it can be a challenge to think of something to praise, especially in a moment when there's not much to praise. But even the simplest thing, you just put on your shoes by yourself. You are really growing up. Or whatever it is you can find. You looked me in the eye. I really appreciate that. Um, maybe they didn't follow all the steps that they needed to do, but they made eye contact. You know, find something that they can feel good about. Also, we are told to smile at our children. I didn't realize, having toddlers, how much I don't smile. I'm, I'm, I'm task-oriented, and I, we are doing this and this and this, and this is our goal. But we are supposed to smile. And I think I put these quotes up. The first one's a paraphrase. 
A smile of approval, a word of encouragement will bring sunshine to the heart for hours. Just a smile of approval. And, and when you think of that, and if you have children and you just think of the difference it makes, or even try it, try it at home, smile at them when you wouldn't normally, and just see the, the, um, the effect that it has on their countenance. Another quote from Avendis Holm, how closely can she bind these dear ones to her heart that her presence will be to them the sunniest place in the world? How I want my presence to be the sunniest place for my children. That's exactly what we all want, especially the mothers. So for our children to find our presence to be the most desirable place that they want to be, to be the most uplifting and sunniest place, we must incorporate uh, a change in our language for me and a calmness in our home. So we've talked a lot about calmness and words of encouragement, and this does not negate the need for correction. We still need to correct our children, but we can do it in a way that says, I love you. When we incorporate these principles in our life, we will be able to correct our children in a loving and calm way, in a way that will change their hearts instead of promote rebellion. We will be able to recognize the chaos, then ask ourselves, am I calm? and then seek strength from above if we are not calm. And then once we have reconnected with our Father, we can seek to understand the situation, which oftentimes is different than I first perceived it. And finally, with a calm voice and body, we can correct the issue and help the children practice the better way of handling that situation. And maybe you have an exceptionally difficult child, and we are given encouragement for this as well. She says in Adventist Home, the more unlovely they are, the greater pains you should take to reveal your love for them. When the child has confidence that you want to make him happy, love will break every barrier down. When they know they are loved, we can reach their heart, even while correcting them. All right, we're going to switch gears slightly here. We're going to talk about our third key, that's intentional time outside. So the average American child spends somewhere between four and seven minutes playing outside per day and over seven hours in front of a screen. And that's likely not the case in a lot of the families here this weekend, but I think that number is pretty stark. Now, it's also suggested that your kids should be outside four to six hours a day And our kids are not outside four to six hours on every day, but that is our goal most of the time, to simply get them outside as much as possible. Why is that so important? Studies have shown that kids are happier, smarter, easier to educate, more attentive, less anxious. I mean, a lot of good qualities here just by being outside. Uh, In the book Education, Ella White says, the more quiet and simple the life of the child, the more free from artificial excitement and the more in harmony with nature, the more favorable it is to physical and mental vigor and to spiritual strength. And I think we probably all want to raise spiritual champions. So getting outside, amazing. But it's not just getting outside, at least not for us. We have really tried to incorporate an intentionality to being outside. Um, we love being out in the garden. We are picking weeds, and we try to find, you know, object lessons when we're out there. So we'll talk to the kids, okay, we're pulling the weeds of disobedience or the weeds of uh, defiance or or selfishness, selfishness, or, you know, pick a character trait that you want to pull that weed out. And then we'll transition that into you know, putting in the seeds of selflessness or kindness or obedience or cheerfulness. We try to find ways in nature to teach them things. We'll talk about the branches of the apple tree connected to the trunk, and they produce lovely fruit. And just like that, when we're connected to Jesus, we can produce the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, we talk about the importance of the sunshine plus the soil and the water, So those three pieces, and we link them to the need we have for the Bible, 
combined with prayer and the Holy Spirit to grow us spiritually. So we're constantly looking for these ways. And when we're outside, we find them. The more time we spend out there, the more we see them. Um, and the more we do it, it's this nice effect that it just keeps coming to mind. Uh, one other thing we've done in an intentional way, we were not very good farmers or, you know, <laughs> gardeners or anything, Uh, but every year we do a little bit more and we get very excited in the spring uh, when we're planting and our garden's a little bigger, a little bigger, and we watch these plants grow and we watch these little, you know, peppers or tomatoes grow and they start turning colors and the kids get so excited. They want to eat them immediately even though they're not ripe yet. But when they do get ripe, we have adopted something that the Israelites did, which is to give their first fruits to God. And so we pick those first fruits, those first tomatoes, those first peppers, green beans, whatever it is that comes in first, and we'll put them on a platter and we'll take them to our neighbors and we'll give them to them. And that's our little first offering, um, our first fruit offering. And there's another uh, resource that we have found to be really helpful. And I have it... Uh Sorry about that. Uh, I have it here. It's Meet Jesus Outside. And we actually have a copy for everybody that wants one on the back table. Let me get this going again. There we go. And what this is, is the idea behind it is to go on prayer walks with your family, with your children. And it takes a Bible story, breaks it up into several little parts. And... um, you find lessons in nature and you go through a Bible story together and it discusses short parts and then you pray together and then you might move to another section uh, and and you'll work your way through it. And so if if you're having a hard time finding something to do outside that has a spiritual application, this is a wonderful resource and it's free for anybody who wants one. There's a bunch in the back. The next key is what you see here. It's called Family Fun Time, and it is exactly what the title says. It is time for the family to have fun. Uh, It is a very simple thing. I'm going to read you another quote. This one from Adventist Home. Parents should be much at home. Give some of your leisure hours to your children. If parents would gather the children close to them and show an interest in their work and in their sports, sometimes even being a child among children, they would make the children very happy and would gain their love and win their confidence. Let parents devote the evenings to their families and lay off the cares of the day. Now for us, this means Sunday through Thursday, so those five days, a time in the evening that we have fun together. And we have five members in our family, so each person, even down to the little two-year-old, gets to pick the activity. And that might mean putting a puzzle together, or reading stories, or (laughs) running around the house, or uh, doing little push-ups and sit-up exercises that the kids are love to do. Whatever it is, each person gets to pick something. And even if it's not their favorite thing, their day is going to come up the next day. And the idea is simply to Just stop everything else, put your phones aside, computers aside, and have fun as a family. And the kids look forward to it. They really have fun with this. All right, our last and final key is personal, unrushed spiritual time. We cannot give what we don't have. And I am sure most of you have heard all of your lives the importance of spending time in the morning with Jesus. I think of the verse in John uh, 15, verse 5, Jesus is sharing how he is the vine and we are the branches, and that if we abide in him, we will bear much fruit. But without him, we can do nothing. And I have experienced this in my own life time and again. Life is so busy. We are getting up early to get to work, or maybe we've worked all night and we're exhausted and ready for much-needed sleep. Maybe we've been up throughout the night with multiple different kids and we are just anticipating the needs of the day. There always seems to be something or some reason to not get up in the morning. But I will share with you that on the days I choose to get up early and have unrushed time with Jesus, it has made a profound and noticeable difference in my life that day. 
It is so significant that at the end of the day, I often wonder, why do I not choose this time with him every morning? There is a soft presence with me throughout the day. Somehow I'm able to handle the squabbles and the noise of the children in a calm manner. Somehow I'm able to better discern their little trials instead of just seeing how it's interrupting my flow of things. Somehow I have the grace on my lips to share a love that comes from above. It is truly amazing the profound difference I have experienced when I make the choice to get up. And it is only something that can be appreciated if it is experienced personally. And then it's something you never want to let go. One of my favorite books from Ellen White is the book Education. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. And here is a favorite quote of mine. Um, It's long, but we're going to read it together here. It says, many, even in their seasons of devotion, fail of receiving the blessing of real communion with God. They are in too great haste. With hurried steps, they press through the circle of Christ's loving presence, pausing perhaps a moment within the sacred precincts, but not waiting for counsel. They have no time to remain with the divine teacher. With their burdens, they return to their work. These workers can never attain the highest success until they learn the secret of strength. They must give themselves time to think, to pray, to wait upon God for a renewal of physical, mental, and spiritual power. They need the uplifting influence of his spirit. Receiving this, they will be quickened by fresh life. The wearied frame and tired brain will be refreshed. The burdened heart will be lightened. That's one of my favorite quotes in that book. So I highly encourage you, if you are not in the habit of getting up early to have unrushed time with Jesus, consider trying it for 10 days or even two days and see the difference that it will make. And some people I've struggled in the past with really connecting. I've had scripture time and I just have had trouble connecting. And a friend of mine shared a method of personal devotions with me that has been very enriching for me. And um, it's journaling, which I'm not a a real journal person, but I'll show you kind of a picture of what I do. It it takes about 30 minutes, but basically you take one, one to two verses and you write them out and then you go through these four different parts and it's all about communion with God. You're actually having a conversation with him and I can show, talk to you more about it afterwards if you're interested in it. But this method has been very rewarding for me in um, having a much deeper connection with my Heavenly Father. So let's get that manna every morning before it is melted by the sun. And let's say to the Lord, my voice shalt thou hear in the morning. O Lord, in the morning I will direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. That's Psalms 5 verse 3. And I just want to interject that that section, let me go back here. It was called unrushed spiritual time and she, she referenced it, but the part that is so significantly different for us was the unrushed part, right? I think everybody here probably has had or already has regular devotions or wants to at least. But the part that made this big difference for us was the unrushed part. And that requires even more sacrifice, not just for the person doing it, but probably for the spouse too. Because if, if I want to be able to give Jennifer unrushed time, I need to take care of the kids. And if she wants to give me unrushed time, or we have to wake up at very early hours or stay up late, but that maybe works not quite as well because your mind may not be as clear. But to me, the reason we included this, I think, was that unrushed part. And I just wanted to even more emphasize that the experience is very different, at least for us, when it's unrushed. Mm -hmm. It's not checking a box. It's not, uh, there's just no defined time. And that part, I just wanted to emphasize that just one extra time. Okay, we're going to quickly recap. I know we're running out of time here, so we may have to go quickly here through the end of our presentation. So the recap, we talked about our story. We started with Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. That's been our anchor passage for the whole talk. We talked about our New Year commitments, getting out of debt, country living, and then we moved into our five keys, self-government, calmness, intentional time outside, family fun time, and unrushed spiritual time. 
So I want to give us a chance to just quickly practice this, and it may incorporate a couple of those keys. So I, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but I'm guessing a lot of us have a smartwatch on our wrist. We look down, we see all kinds of information. We see the news, the weather, obviously the time, and probably our heart rate is on there for most of us. And for this illustration, we're going to use that heart rate maybe as a proxy for calmness. All right, so just with that in mind, we're going to do a quick mental exercise. Imagine you're at home, you're making breakfast for your family, you look into the corner of the room, you see that your dog has thrown up into the corner. Your kids are very fascinated by this because they are not used to that. So one of them grabs a spoon off the table and starts playing with it. Another runs over to see what's going on. They slip in it, they fall, they're covered in it, they're crying. And you abandon what you're making, which is pancakes, and now they're burning. And the smoke alarm goes off. And when you're about to pull your hair out, you hear the doorbell ring. So in that moment, if you look down at your wrist, what might you see? What do you think your response would be in that moment? I'm not asking anyone to answer, by the way. <laughs> All right. Oh, now, if we look back at our anchor passage and we focus in on... I messed you up, sorry. And we focus in on verse 8. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Now, if we think about looking down at our wrists, what if we saw the words and commands of God? Or they were on our forehead between, in, between the, front, as frontlets between your eyes. What if the words and commands like, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Be anxious for nothing. The peace of God will guard your heart and mind. And my favorite, in everything, give thanks. In everything, in this situation, give thanks. Now, what would your response be? Would you feel a calmness? Would you feel maybe an ability to handle that situation a little bit differently? If this passage was real, if it was on your wrist, if it was in between your eyes, all the time. So the real question is, what if you actually lived Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9? What does it mean for you? Maybe your children are grown and out of the house. Maybe you have young kids in the home. You might have good relationships. You might have some that are strained. What changes would you make if you lived Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, starting today? And I want you to think about this question. What would be the very next step the Holy Spirit is calling you to do? Maybe starting today or tomorrow. What would be the very next step? So this is what I want you to do. That family vision that we started, turn that paper over. And if you've been taking notes, find another paper. There should be some kind of all over the place. I want you to write that down. We're just going to take a minute, but what would be the very next step the Holy Spirit is calling you to do if you were living Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, and if you're wanting to get to that family vision that we talked about at the very beginning, is there a step? Has the Holy Spirit been working on you while we've been talking or while you've been here at the conference so far? Maybe there's this little voice. Maybe not. That's okay, too, but think about it. Take a minute if there's something, write it down. And then I'm going to ask you to get out of your comfort zone a little. I'm out of my comfort zone being up here, so that <laughs> I've checked that box. Uh, my wife enjoys being up front. I don't, but I'm here. I'm out of my comfort zone. So I'm going to ask you guys to get out of your comfort zones a little bit too. So write something down or think about something, that next step. And then this is the part where I'm asking you to get out of your comfort zone. I want you to get up out of your seat and find somebody and tell them what that next step is. It has been found that if you share a goal with someone, you are far more likely to follow through with it, far more likely. And this goal is hopefully something that is meaningful. This is something worth getting out of your comfort zone for. So we want you to get up. We want you to tell somebody this. 
So we'll do that now. We'll just take one minute to do that, and then we'll come back together and have a prayer. And I want you guys to keep sharing. I'm not trying to interrupt anything. Keep sharing. But for anybody that already has finished, we are going to come together one last time for a final word of prayer. And we want this family vision to be something you continue to talk about or continue to think about. And we've shared a lot of things, and we've had to move relatively quickly. We've talked about a lot of different resources. We have a resource page in the back if anything was interesting. And we are here. We'd love to answer any questions. We don't have time for like a back and forth where everybody's here, but you are welcome to stay and ask us questions if there was anything that piqued your interest or you just wanted a little more clarity on something. Uh, and that Meet Jesus Outside book is in the back too. But if you guys will, I'm going to close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, today you have led us on a journey. We have read your admonition to us to love you first and to put our family second, to teach our children diligently. Your word and your commands, not just in the evening worship, but all day. Not just to teach your precepts, but to write them on our hearts and our minds and to live them out. Father, you love us so much. We cannot even comprehend how much. And you're calling each person here to make a change, whatever that might be. Lord, I pray earnestly that your Holy Spirit would come and strengthen us, strengthen each person here to follow through with the commitment that they came up with today that you have called them to do. I thank you for promising to instruct us and teach us and guide us each step of the way. And we look forward to your very soon return. And on that day, may we boldly say, here am I and the children whom thou hast given me. This is our prayer. In the precious and holy name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen.